Well, good morning again. It is a blessed day to be in the house of the Lord, to come together as a church to worship Him and to study Your Word, to study His Word. I want to thank the parents today of those children who were baptized for letting me do it. It is a privilege from the Lord to be able to baptize those kids. And I also want to commend the parents, the grandparents, the aunts, the uncles, I know that family was deeply involved in every one of those child's lives, and they presented the gospel to them. I commend you for that. Praise God for your willingness to share Jesus with that relative, with that youngster. This week, I've been thinking about children. I was thinking about Jace and Mackenzie and Ashton. I was thinking about the children of our church, the children in our community, and I was thinking about my own child on the way, August 17th, we hope been really thinking about Trisha's been gone this weekend and I can't look over there and see the baby I've been thinking about these children they're so precious aren't they so innocent so sweet there's so many things they don't know isn't it there's so many things that they haven't experienced and if you're like me there's so many things I hope they never have to experience I hope they don't make the same mistakes that I did and that we did amen You have the potential to change that. You have the potential to influence and to impact your children for good. You need to be sharing Christ with your child. You need to be sharing the fact that you love them personally. But another of the most important things you can share with your child is the danger of sin. The dangerous nature of sin. I was thinking this week as I was preparing this message, I'm 28 years old right now, and I was thinking about the guys and girls that I grew up with. And I started to just go through and recall faces and recall names, and I can't tell you how many of the folks that I grew up with that I went to church with, that right now they're dead, or in rehab, or in prison, or on their fifth marriage, can't hold a job down, just struggling in so many different ways. Did they start that way? No. They started with so much potential, and they still have potential, mind you. But they didn't start out on that road to destruction. They didn't start out headed that direction. They started out with so much potential. How did it happen in their lives? How did they come to find themselves in that condition? Well, some of it was they just rebelled. They knew the truth. They were brought up in a godly home. They were taught the truth at home and at church. And they just made a willful decision to rebel, to disobey. Others, though, their parents never sat them down. They never sat them down and they never said, Child, you watch out for sin. You watch out. You keep a short leash on it or it will get you. Sin wants to ruin your life, destroy you, destroy your future, ruin your potential. Many of my friends are in that condition because nobody sat them down. Folks, we have to do that. We have to take this younger generation, these children, these youth, and look at them straight in the face, eyeball eyeball to eyeball, and say, be careful. Watch out. This morning, I want to talk to you about that. I want to talk to you about warning your children about sin. I don't want to talk just to the parents. I want to talk to the grandparents. I want to talk to all of you. We have the potential as believers to influence children for good. And what I want you to do right here, right now, is commit. Commit to telling those children, to telling those youth in your life the dangers of sin. Take your Bible and open it to the book of Proverbs. The Old Testament book of Proverbs, and this morning we're going to be coming from Proverbs chapter 1, and we're going to look at verses 7 to 19. Proverbs comes from a type of literature in the Old Testament called wisdom literature. Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Job, those books make up wisdom literature in the Bible. And wisdom literature, that's simply... Uh, means uh, teaching practical discipleship, teaching how to live for God daily, teaching 
how to make decisions based upon the fear of the Lord. The book of Proverbs by Solomon, he's writing to his son. He's writing to Rehoboam. And he's wanting to teach him how to live for God. How to be a godly man, a godly king. And in our passage of study this morning, he talks to him about the dangers of sin. Look at this passage with me. Let's begin in verse 7 of Proverbs chapter 1. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. My son, hear the instruction of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother, for they shall be an ornament of grace unto thy neck and chains about thy neck. My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. If they say, come with us, let us lay wait for blood, let us lurk privily, for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them up alive as the grave and whole as those that go down into the pit. We shall find all precious substance. We shall fill our houses with spoil. Cast in your lot among us. Let us all have one purse. My son, walk thou not in the way with them. Refrain thy foot from their path, for their feet run to evil and make haste to shed blood. Surely in vain the net is spread in the sight of any bird. And they lay wait for their own blood. They lurk privily for their own lives. So are the ways of everyone that is greedy of gain, which taketh away the life of the owners thereof. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. In verses 7 to 9, we have the thesis statement of the book of Proverbs. He says that wisdom comes through fear of the Lord. That's true knowledge. That is true wisdom. And that's going to be the thesis of the entire book. But it's no coincidence that immediately after he tells us the thesis statement of the book, the most important issue to fear the Lord, to reverence Him, to respect Him, that immediately after that, he starts to warn about sin. That's no coincidence. He does that because teaching your children, teaching these youngsters about sin is so very important. He presents in verses 10 to 19 a hypothetical situation based upon reality. And he talks about how these sinful folks want to entice, how sin wants to ruin the lives of these youngsters. We're going to look at this passage this morning and we're going to see three warnings. Three things that we need to tell our children. Tell the children in your family. Tell the children in your church. Tell the children who are around you about sin. Before we go any further, though, let us go to the Lord in prayer and ask His blessing on this part of the service. Our Father, we come before You. Lord, we are so grateful, Father, to be able to enter into Your presence and to worship You, Lord. Father, this is not something that we do lightly or flippantly. We come respectfully and we come with reverence because we know who you are. You are the Lord, the one true and living God. Father, we want to thank you that we do know you. We want to thank you, Lord, that we can worship you aright. We want to thank you, Lord, for a relationship with you. And Father, we know that Christ Jesus has made all of this possible. This morning, Lord, we thank you for the cross. We thank you, Lord, for the blood of Jesus, that he shed it, that we might be cleansed, that we might be righteous, that we might have a relationship with you. And Father, this morning, I pray that you would be with me as I proclaim this message, Lord. I am not worthy to proclaim your word, but Lord, I thank you that you've called me, and Lord, I thank you that you can use me in spite of my flaws and my sins, Father. Lord, I pray that right now that I would decrease and that Christ would be magnified in this message and through my life. Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would move among us. I pray, Lord, that you'd speak to the parents, that you would speak to the grandparents, that you would speak to all of us who have the potential to influence, to impact a child, a youth, for you, Lord. Speak to our hearts, Lord, and let all of us commit today to warning those younger folks in our lives about sin father if there's a parent here who may be struggling with that lord speak to them today give them the guidance and comfort they need lord father if there's a child or a youth here lord who doesn't know you i pray that you would speak to their hearts as well that you would warn them personally about sin 
And I ask this in the name of Jesus and for his sake. Amen. What do we say to our children, the youth in our lives? What do we say to them about sin? Solomon tells us. He gives us some warnings to issue them. The first thing that we see in this passage that we should warn them about is that sin seeks to isolate. Sin isolates. I want to call your attention to that passage that we just read. Look at verses 11 to 14 of that passage. I just read it, but I want to read those verses again, and I'm going to emphasize certain words, and I want you to pick up on it because I'm going to be talking about those words. Listen to this. My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. All right, here we go into the passage. If they say, come with us, let us lay wait for blood, let us lurk privily for the innocent without cause, let us swallow them up alive as the grave as those that go down into the pit. We shall find all precious substance. We shall fill our houses with spoil. Cast in thy lot among us, let us all have one purse. Do you hear the words that I emphasized? Those are the personal pronouns there in verses 11 to 14. We've read that passage a lot, but we miss out on something. There's a very subtle hint at something, and it's a very important truth that we need to recognize that we need to know. Do you hear what those sinners are doing, how they are enticing that young son? If you understand that, you will understand how they will entice the children in your life. Do you hear what they're saying? Leave what you know. Leave behind who you are. Turn away from them and be a part of our group. Do you hear it? Join us. Become a part of our family. Become a part of our sinful gang. That's what they're saying. Leave behind who you are. Leave behind what you know. Leave behind your godly family. Leave behind your church family and come join us us you hear what they're doing they're wanting to isolate them they're wanting to isolate the youth from the positive influences in their lives and why do they want to do that because if you can change a person's company you can change their behavior you can change their attitude the apostle paul wrote in first corinthians chapter 15 verse 33 he said be not deceived evil communications corrupt good manners Another rendering of that verse says that evil company corrupts good morals. Hear what Paul is saying? The company you keep is going to affect your lifestyle. It's going to affect your behavior. So do you know what lost sinful folks are going to do? You know what the enemies, or what the agents of our, in, oh, I can't even talk this morning, the enemies' agents are going to do? They're going to come to your child and say, Leave behind what you know. Don't have anything to do with them. Come be with us. They want to isolate that child because then they'll give in to temptation. Then their behavior will change. And folks, in my ministry, I've seen this happen over and over and over again with children and with youth. The agents of the enemy, they come along and they want to isolate a child from his family or her family. They want to isolate a child from his church family. Why do they want to do that? Well, let's camp out for just a second. Why do they want to isolate your child from his or her family? Because you're the ones that can shake them up. It's happened before, hadn't it, mama and daddy? Your son, your daughter, they go into something and you say, hold on here. You're not seeing things clearly. Look. You go that direction, you keep that path, and you're going to run headlong into sin, headlong into destruction. They want to isolate from the family because if they can do, do that, they can change that child, change your son, change your daughter or grandchildren. I've seen things happen in my ministry. I, I, I've seen it happen over and over again. I'll get a call from a mother or from a father, and they'll say, Brother Randy, have you heard from so-and-so? And they'll say their child's name, and I'll say, well, no, what's going on? Well, he's in college, and I hadn't heard from him for several weeks. I'm calling, he, he, he won't answer. And I feel like something's wrong. And there have been times when I've gone to dorm rooms 
I've gone to check on the child. The parents wanted me to. You knock on the door, and the boy opens the door, and you look at him, and he's hung over. You know he's been involved with alcohol, and who knows what else? What's happened to him? He's gotten into that crowd. He's isolated from the family that loves him, and he's going headlong into sin. I've seen it happen at other times. A mother will call me distraught and say, I'm so worried about my daughter. She's in high school. I'm worried about her. She's withdrawn. She's not confiding in me as before. Can you talk to her? Can you do something? I've taken a Sunday school teacher, a godly lady in the church, and we go and we talk to her. And you can tell by the way she looks down, by the look in her eyes, by the tone of her voice, what's happened. She's given a sacred gift meant for her husband to a young high school punk. That's what sin wants to do to your children. That's what sin wants to do to your family. To put up a barrier. To isolate them. And then take them by the hand. And take them down that road of destruction. Warn the children. Warn the the youth. Tell them there are folks who want to separate us. There are folks who want to do you harm and they want to put a barrier up and they want to lead you away from us and lead you away from the Lord. Don't listen. Don't follow them. Warn them, folks. Warn them that sin isolates from those that love them, from those that care about them. I've seen it happen with the church as well. These folks, they come along, they want to separate that child, separate that youth from the church family that loves them so much. Do you know why it's such a struggle to keep children in the church? Because that's laying the foundation. Church can't do everything. It needs a family to complement it, to reinforce the teaching. But at that moment in their lives, the foundation for the rest of their journey in life is being laid. It's being laid as they hear the authoritative preaching of the Word of God. It's being laid as they go into these Sunday school classes and hear the Word of God taught. And these groups, they want to come and they want to lead that child, lead that youth away so that they can change their worldview, so that they can change their beliefs. And I've seen it replayed over and over again. There'll be a girl or a boy, they love church, love their church family, and they'll come so consistent, so faithful. You'll see the Lord move in their lives. And then something will happen. Maybe they'll get the driver's license or the car keys. And they start running around with folks that don't don't want to come to church on Wednesdays, don't want to come on Sunday nights. And so they're out doing other things. And you start to see less and less and less and less of them. And then you reach the point where the last time you see them is at a graduation party that the church gives them for graduating high school. And then you never see them again. They're gone to college. Running headlong into sin, estranged from their church family, but... Worst of all, estranged from the Lord. Warn them that sin wants to isolate, wants to take them away from the folks that love them, from the influences that want to see them do their best in serving the Lord. That's the first warning you've got to give your child. Warn them that sin seeks to isolate. Second, you've got to warn them that sin progresses. It progresses. One of the lies of the enemy is that you can relegate sin to one area of your life or to a one-time thing. No, you can't. It grows. It progresses. This week I was reading an article on cancer. And we all have been affected by cancer, have we not? We know folks in our church, folks in our family, or maybe you've experienced it personally, but we all have to deal with cancer in some form or fashion. They say that lung cancer is one of the most aggressive cancers out there. And I read this statement, and it gave a a reason why it was so aggressive and and how it progressed. Listen to this reason. I'm going somewhere with this. Can you all put that up there, the definition there? It says that this, or lung cancer, is the most aggressive because by the time the symptoms begin to be taken seriously by the patients, the cancer manages to spread in such a way that it becomes impossible to remove the affected areas from one localized area. Now, what's it saying there? It says that lung cancer or cancer in general is so aggressive, and what makes it so is that folks don't pay attention to the symptoms. They don't recognize what they are until it's gotten so bad that it's spread all over them. Folks, sin is spiritual cancer. 
It won't stay in one place. If you leave it alone, it's not just going to lie dormant. It's going to grow. It's going to progress. It's going to expand until it affects every single area of your life. And then you know what it's going to do after it's infected you? It's going to hop on and influence and affect the people around you. That's how aggressive sin is. Solomon talks to his son about that. And he warns him about the progressive nature of sin. And in this passage of Scripture, he gives a threefold progression of that spiritual cancer known as sin. Listen to what he says. It's threefold. Let me give these three to you, then we'll look at the passage. He says it starts with mental consideration. You get tempted and you start to think about sin. To entertain it in your mind, the wheels start to turn and you think, oh, how good it would be. See, a lot of us think we can stop it right there. If it's in our mind, it's not hurting anybody. If we're just dwelling on it mentally, not bothering anybody, not hurting my family, the Lord knows. And it's not going to stay there. It moves on. Then comes physical presence. You think about something, you're tempted to do something, and then you just go along. You go along with it. You're not going to do it. You're just going to be there while it's done. Oh, it don't stay there. Then it moves to its final state. Active participation when you're doing it you're up to your eyeballs in it that's what Solomon describes here look how he describes the mental consideration he starts it in verse 10 as he warns his son he said my son if sinners entice thee consent thou not that word consent means mental affirmation if someone comes up to you if these sinful folks, if these agents of the enemy, they come up to you and they entice you and they tempt you, you don't think about it in your mind. You don't sit there and turn it over and think, huh, that might be good. That might be enjoyable. Don't do that. Stop. Don't give your consent to it. And then he goes further. He talks about the physical presence. First they say, he he tells them, don't think about it. And then he gives this hypothetical scenario there. He says, if they say, come with us, let us lay wait for blood. Let us lurk privily for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them up alive as the grave and whole as those that go down into the pit. You hear what they're saying? Verse 11, just come with us. Oh, you don't have to participate. Just come. Be with our group. Don't have to do it. In fact, you know what? You might even be a witness if you go. Have you heard that before? That's what these folks want to do, hadn't it? How many times has it happened? These folks, they come up and they want somebody to go to a party. Is there going to be drinking there? Is there going to be drugs there? Yeah, but you don't have to. You don't have to. It's, it's okay. It's all right. Don't worry about it. Just come. Have a good time. We need a designated driver anyway. Come. Doesn't stay there, does it? Then he runs headlong into active participation. Look what it says. Look there at at verse 14, the last part of that. Cast in thy lot among us. Let us all have one purse. You hear what he's saying? Don't just come. Don't just be there. Do it. Cast in your lot with us. Do it. Be with us. Take part in it. And then what happens? Before you can turn around, before you can blink, you're up to your eyeballs in sin. You look in the mirror, you don't recognize yourself. You've changed from the person that you were. There's experience, sinful experiences that will always be with you. Do you see how it progresses? Do you see how it advances? We've got to warn our children about that. They think they can do it one time. They think that they can get by with it. And it'll all be okay. No, it won't. No, it won't. I'll tell you this story. I I was counseling a guy who was getting married. And I'm not going to give you his name, but you wouldn't know him anyways years ago. I was counseling this guy who was getting married, doing premarital counseling. And then I like to do a follow-up several months after they're married and living together. And so he came in, and we began to talk. And... I asked him how things were going, and he just broke down and he started to cry. And I said, what's going on? Is there something wrong with with your marriage? No, 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 my relationship's wonderful. I love my wife. Not saying that. But he said, I wish somebody had warned me about sin, about premarital sexual experiences. And he related this story of how 
when he was to be with his wife, he was thinking about, you know what, other experiences. He didn't know. He didn't know how it would harm him. He didn't know how it would progress in his life. You and I know, don't we? We've had experiences. We that are adults, we know what sin does, how it advances in our lives, how it tears us up. Warn the children. Warn the youth. Tell them, don't you keep on going that direction. You keep a short leash on sin. You... Every time it comes up, every time the Holy Spirit brings it on, you confess it, you repent, you deal with it right then, right there, before it's too late. Then lastly, we warn that sin isolates, that sin progresses, but then you also have to warn that sin ruins. It ruins. Look at verses 15 to 19 of our passage. It says, My son... Walk not thou in the way with them. That means don't be apart with them. Don't give in to their lifestyle. Refrain thy foot from their path. For their feet run to evil and make haste to shed blood. Surely in vain the net is spread in the sight of any bird. And they lay wait for their own blood. They lurk privily for their own lives. So are the ways of everyone that is greedy of gain, which taketh away the lives of the owners thereof. I've been thinking about that part of the passage in particular this week and meditating on it. And as you chew on the Word of God and meditate on it, He speaks, doesn't He? He brings out different things. The Word of God is like a diamond. You put it up to the light and you just see all different new things, wonderful things that you didn't notice before. I was thinking about this passage, that part of it, and praying through it. Do you realize what Solomon is saying to the boy right there, to the son? Here is Solomon, the wisest man in the world. Here's Solomon, the most powerful man in Israel. And yet he says right there, boy, son, if you go so far into sin, there will be a point, even with all my power, even with all my personal resources, where I can't get you out of it. That's what he's saying right there. If you follow sin to its ultimate conclusion, it's going to take you out you hear what he's telling his son hear what he's telling Rehoboam sin will ruin you it's like a virus that ends up consuming its host that's what Solomon's saying right there and folks you may not have seen it but I've seen it there comes a certain point in time when the family's resources are no good they pray and the Lord can and he will deliver but I'm talking about their physical resources are no good. I've seen families who are wealthy, who have bought their kids out of jail, paid the lawyer bills, do it over and over and over again to get them out, and there finally comes a point in time when they can't do it. No amount of money is going to fix that situation. They are there as a consequence for their sin. I've seen families who've had influence. They know the sheriff. They know the chief of police. They know the judge. And so many times when that boy or that girl gets into trouble, they go and talk to him and they smooth it out. And they get leniency. But there comes even a time there when the influence is no good, when it has to run its course. And it will. Sin will ruin. And you need to tell your child that. Don't hide it. Tell them. You follow this, it'll kill you. It'll ruin your life. It'll tear up your future. It will ruin all of your potential. This Friday, I, I went to visit my parents, and I was talking to them at the dinner table, and they were asking me what I was preaching on, and I was talking to them about it, and they told me a story, and I was so young, I didn't really remember it. When they said it, it kind of jogged my memory. When I was a boy about six or seven years old, they were telling me that we would go to Sack and Save in Jackson, Mississippi, to buy our groceries when Daddy got paid. And we had gone there, and we were at a red light, and uh, we were in our little Jeep Wagoneer, and I remember looking out the window, and they said there was a drunk guy there, that he was literally sitting down in the gutter, yelling and screaming and talking to himself. And that I asked him, I said, what's wrong with him? Why is he so dirty? Who's he talking to? And my mother said she turned around, and she said, he's there because of sin. He's pursued sin, and it's gotten him, and it's overcome him. And she said, I didn't say anything else the rest of the way home after hearing that. 
Well, folks, that's what you have to do. Warn those children. Warn those youngsters in your life that sin will ruin. Let's all of us commit to being that positive influence to make that godly impact on a child. Tell those children, tell those youth in your life about sin. Right now, though, we're going to have an altar call, a time of decision. I want to ask you whether you be a child, youth, or adult, as we have talked about sin, do you recognize that you are a sinner? Do you recognize that you are a sinner and that you are in need of a Savior? You can't fix your sin problem on your own. That's like trying to take a teaspoon and empty the Atlantic Ocean. You can't do it, but Jesus can. By His blood, your sins can be forgiven. By His blood, you can be cleansed and made right. Do you have a relationship with Jesus? If not, I want to invite you to come. Let me talk to you, and let's begin a relationship today. Jesus did it all on the cross. He requires two things from you. Faith and repentance. Faith is a wholehearted commitment to the Lord and what He has done for you on the cross. Repentance is a turning away from that sin. I want to open it up to the lost this morning, but I also want to open it up to everyone else. Are you a parent and are you needing instruction right now about the children in your life? Come up here and ask the Lord to give you that instruction, to give you that wisdom to help the children in your life. Maybe you've got a child and you just even right now want to pray for their salvation. Come and do that. Pray for that child's salvation. Or maybe you have a child and they've done everything I've talked about. They're isolated from you. Sin has progressed. It's all in their life. It's hurt them so bad. And it stands to ruin their future. You come up here and you pray for them. Prayer changes things. Prayer can move nations, can it? Because our prayer moves the heart of God. We have his ear. Pray for that child. Pray that the Lord would deliver him or her. As we have our time of decision.